morning, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about glaciers today. And even though I'm not here, I'm kind of here. I'm going to be going through this whole presentation PowerPoint style. Um, what I want you to do is you should have notes in front of you. Make sure your name's on it. And this is going to be the glaciers section of erosion. So we've talked about weathering. Somebody quick, what is weathering? Give the definition. Okay, that's right. You should have said the breaking down by physical or chemical means of a rock. Now, what is erosion? Somebody go ahead and raise your hand and answer uh, what, what the definition of erosion is. Okay, good. Somebody should have said the transportation of broken down or weathered rock, right? So weathering is a breaking down of rock and erosion is the transportation of it. So glaciers, in a sense, are responsible for both. They break down rock and they also transport it. So follow along in your notes, and uh, I don't have this in full view on the screen. You're going to see kind of the whole thing. It's just so I can easily get around, okay? So the definition of a glacier is pretty simple. It's a moving mass of snow and ice. And it's pretty crazy to think that we can have this huge piece of solid ice. Obviously, it's, it's just frozen water. There's no life uh, to this glacier at all, but it moves, and it moves on its own, kind of. We'll look at different forces that cause motion. Glaciers form at high elevations and or possibly high latitudes. So high elevations means just like way up in the mountains, right? Does anybody recognize what mountains these are here? Okay, those are the Grand Tetons out in Wyoming, if you didn't know. Um, here on this next globe, we have latitude and longitude lines. Um, teacher, Miss Mortensen, if you can go ahead and pause this and have uh, one student come up and label the latitude and longitude lines. We talked about this a long time ago, but someone come up and, and label those for me. All right, somebody should have just labeled latitude lines, which are latitude, flatitude, we said, or like latitude, like ladder rungs, so they're horizontal, and longitude run vertical from, you know, the North Pole down to the South Pole. Those are uh, longitude lines. So when we say that it's high elevations or high latitudes, we mean either it's high up in the mountains or it's up towards the North Pole or down towards the South Pole at the bottom. And the formation really is pretty simple. It's exactly what you would think it is. Uh, we're just breaking it down into a few easy steps. First of all, you got to have winter snow. The winter snow accumulation, or the, the amount that actually falls, exceeds or is greater than the summer melt-off. So maybe here in Nenana, we end up getting eight feet of snow this winter. We didn't get that much, but if we did, okay, eight feet of snow. Then summer rolls around and it gets warm and we have most of it melt off, but maybe only six feet of it melted off. So come next winter, we would have two feet of snow that we're building on, right? And as we get that buildup of snow over time and over time, uh, maybe the next year we get another eight feet and then six feet melt off. So now we have four feet of snow by the next year when winter starts up. We get this old ice that accumulates and that's how it forms. The second step is that snow buried under the weight of the ice above compresses into ice. Right? So snow over time is going to compress and it's going to get closer and closer together, those little frozen bits of water, and they turn into ice. We can see this outside on the road right now because, man, that snow has been out there for a long time. And if you walk down the road right in front of the school or right on the side of the, of the school or really anywhere around the town, it's all going to be pretty much ice because it's been compacted pretty well for a pretty long time. So we have a bunch of snow. It's compacted and compressed into ice. And eventually we're going to get enough pressure that causes the ice to flow like a thick liquid. We call this plastic flow. Miss um, Martinson, I set um, a little container of Silly Putty up here on the desk for you. If you could take out the silly putty, roll it 
so it's like a snake, okay? Just do it in your hands, or you can have a student do this. And then right on top of the projector, so everyone can see it, stick it on top. So it's sticking straight up, um, almost like a, I don't know what sticks straight up like that, like a flagpole, okay? Like a flagpole or a tree, right? A tree that's just growing out of the projector. Go ahead and stick it there, and we'll leave it there for a while, okay? And the fourth step is flowing out from the center of accumulation. Accumulation just means where everything gathers, right? So wherever all this snow gathers, it's going to flow. It's going to move away from that center. The ice is pushed outwards or downhill, and the result is, excuse me, whatever is underneath it becomes eroded. It weathers it, it breaks it down, and it transports that material with it. So those are the four steps, right? Very simple, very easy. We start with a whole bunch of snow, and we get more than what actually melts off during the summer. It compresses and turns into ice. That pressure causes it to flow, and it flows outwards, or in case of alpine glaciers, downhill. And the result is it erodes the land under it, okay? So this takes us into the different types of glaciers. We have alpine glaciers, uh, that's the first type. Alpine just means the, in the mountains. So alpine glaciers, we could call them mountain glaciers, same thing. They form in the mountains. An example would be the Rockies, or the Alps, or the Andes, or the Alaska Range. These are all different mountain ranges, and this is where we might find mountain glaciers. That makes sense, right? This is a typical looking mountain glacier. You notice that down here, there's not much snow. So what does that mean? It probably means that it's summertime, or at least a warm time of year, and there's still snow up here. So the winter snow exceeds summer uh, melt off, right? Now this is kind of fun because we can look at these glaciers and we can describe the anatomy of these glaciers. So just like a human is a human, um, a human has different body parts. We might say, yeah, that's a whole human, but that top part, that's the head of the person. That bottom part, all the way down at the bottom that they're standing on the ground with, those are the feet. And then describe other features, right? We do the same with a glacier. So the zone of accumulation is the area where the snow actually accumulates and the ice forms. Sometimes we may have a glacier flowing through an area and there may not actually even be any snow in that area. So that's not the zone of accumulation. The zone of accumulation is wherever this glacier is forming, which could be, in some cases, miles away. And the other main area we're looking at is the zone of wastage. That's the area where the snow and the ice melt. That's pretty easy to think of, right? Accumulation means where something gathers. Uh, so that tells us where the snow is gathering and it creates this glacier. And wastage, wastage just means like to waste. And so where is this glacier wasting away? Where is it melting off? In the zone of wastage, where it's warmer, usually at the bottom, where there is no snow accumulation. And who knows what other factors might also contribute to that. It may be bumping into an ocean or it may be bumping into a river, uh, some water source that's going to cause it to melt even quicker. So some good vocab terms. The word plucking. Um, look at this picture right here. You can see this person standing there and you see this big chunk of rock sitting there, right? Do you think that person, man or woman, whoever they are, do you think that person just picked up that boulder and just moved it? What do you think might have actually caused that rock to move? I mean, that's, that's a big rock. That's probably a couple thousand pounds. It's plucking that causes to move, and plucking is the process of glaciers actually picking up rocks out of the ground, almost like a little kid going around and plucking rocks off the ground, just small little pebbles. In this case, it's a huge glacier moving by, and it just kind of picks up these boulders. So this is one case where it just slightly moves it, but when we would see most plucking take place, it would pick up that boulder and it would just be gone. We wouldn't see it anymore. It might be miles and miles away. 
a crevice, or as Bear Grylls would say, a crevasse. It's a deep crack in the surface of a glacier, and these are all three pictures where we can see uh, really intense crevices. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all extremely dangerous situa situations. You wouldn't want to be hiking along here. These are people who are uh, crazy or have a death wish, or maybe they just really know what they're doing. Uh, but you have to be very careful when you see these. Crevices can go down hundreds of feet, uh, and they usually lead to a pretty cold river at the bottom of a glacier. Uh, so the definition is a deep crack in the surface of a glacier. Now what we see here is kind of what's left behind from a glacier as it moves through. So this might be at the bottom of a mountain. Uh, imagine that up here we have just this big mountain drawn in, right? And this glacier moves down the mountain and stops right there. We get something called the terminal moraine. What does terminal moraine, what does terminal mean? Okay, before we get into what the word moraine means. Terminal. Does anybody know? Terminal just means the end of something. So if you've been in a big city, there's different terminals for buses or terminals for um, trains. And that just means like where it stops, where someone might get off at. Um, and in this case, it means where the glacier ends. The terminal moraine is debris that piles up at the front of the glacier. Or if that glacier melts off, it's kind of the end of that glacier, the furthest point that it moves to. And we would imagine that this is moving down this way. So yeah, that would definitely be the front of it. We can sometimes pretty easily identify these um, by this curved raised surface uh, close to mountains, because again, these are alpine glaciers we're looking at. And that's called a terminal moraine. Now there's many different kinds of moraines, right? So this one is kind of cool. In this picture you can see this uh, big glacier that's moving down the mountain. And it is really crazy. These things kind of get a life of their own, and it's just curving around here. And we can see right at the front of it, this big buildup. So that would be the last vocab term we looked at called the terminal moraine, right? If this were to melt off, we would have this left behind and it'd be pretty easy to identify where this glacier was and where it moved and where it stopped. Now we have lateral moraines. Lateral means to the side, right? That's literally what it means. If you've played football before or you watch football, uh, they talk about laterals in football all the time and it means, you know, pitching the ball to the side. Anyways, this is debris that as this glacier is moving down, it piles up on the side of the glacier. So we can see the terminal moraine, and we can also see the lateral moraines. We can see this buildup of silt and sand and huge boulders all piled up along the side. Glaciers are not very picky and choosy. They just pick up whatever's there in front of them, no matter how big, no matter how small it is, and they just move it. And the last one is called a medial moraine. So we've looked at terminal, which means end, and moraine is just debris. We've looked at lateral. Lateral means to the side, and a lateral moraine, so it's debris that's to the side. And lastly, we're looking at medial moraine. Now, this should be kind of obvious what medial means, but medial means like in the middle. If we think about a road and cars driving down opposite directions, we have the line in the middle, the yellow line, and that is the median, right? So that just means it's going right down the middle. So the medial moraine is right down the middle, debris that accumulates. So in this picture, it's kind of tough to tell, but we have two glaciers coming together. This one here on the right is flowing down this way, and this one on the left is flowing down from the left all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And so we have two of them converging, coming together. And since we have two of them pushing uh, debris out to the sides, creating lateral moraines, when they join one another, they're going to end up forming this medial moraine, which runs right through the middle of the two. And again, we can think of this just like a street with different lanes of traffic. And right in the middle, a median that runs between the two lanes.
Okay, so those are all alpine glaciers. Those are all terms that we use to refer to alpine glaciers. Here's a nice pretty picture of an alpine glacier. And we can see several different types of moraines here. We can see, oh, here's a nice median moraine, medial moraine, sorry, from this one flowing in with this one. Uh, we can see terminal moraine, kind of right here, and lateral moraines. You can see many moraines going on here. A few more vocab terms that we need to know. These are fun vocab terms um, because we see these just an hour south of us. So if you've been down to Healy or if you've been to Denali, start kind of brainstorming in your mind, have I seen these shapes before? Do these look familiar at all? Because chances are if you've looked around much or if you've hiked around much around Denali or just seen some photos, you've probably seen some of these shapes, okay? So this first one is called a cirque. A cirque is a bowl-shaped depression. Um, basically, it's on three sides that we have this bowl shape, right? Think of like cirque, like a circus, or like Cirque du Soleil, uh, if you know that reference. Uh, a, a circus, there's performers, and I think of this as being like a stage. Some people will call it an amphitheater type shape, where it's like uh, these three sides, uh, where people are sitting in stadium seats and then down at the bottom uh, at the front we have this platform where someone might be performing. That's a cirque. Uh, a cirque forms when there's a bunch of snow that accumulates and it just runs down these slopes and obviously it has to go somewhere and so it carves out one side and that's this fourth side which is not built up and it just kind of flows down in that direction. That's a cirque. Here's another picture of a cirque, right? So we can see the snow and ice has accumulated. Uh, it's created glaciers and it flows down. We can, we can imagine which direction it'd be flowing down from all sides. And eventually, it's going to flow right into what? That's right, this body of water. If it's an ocean or river, or lake, whatever it may be, it's going to flow right down into that. The next one is A-R-E-T-E. We call that an arete, okay? Arete, we can see this arrow at the top pointing right to that fine little point. It is a sharp, knife-like ridge that connects separate glacial valleys. Glacial erosion is happening on two sides. So yeah, this is just a ridge. It's like a knife blade, basically. It's very fine, very thin. You would not want to hike along this ridge. It'd be really difficult. Uh, really, you wouldn't want to be on this at all. That looks pretty difficult to navigate anywhere on there. Um, but what I want you guys to do is just, in one second, when I tell you go, uh, I want you to pause this. Um, but I want somebody to come up, and I want somebody to label where, just using arrows, two arrows, label where two glaciers might go that would create this arete, okay? So somebody come on up and do that. I want you to pause it. My marks are set, go! Okay, so what you should have done is drawn in an arrow to the right of this arete, flowing down, showing that a glacier might move in that direction, and then to the left of it. We can see this valley way to the left. That would be carved out by a glacier, and that's what's going to create this arete. Here's another photo of an arete. We can see this really shiny, sharp ridge at the top uh, created by two separate valleys of glaciers moving through it. The next one is a William horn. I mean a horn. Uh, a horn is a sharp peaked mountain carved on all sides by a glacier. William, I bet you didn't know that you had a last name that was geologically related, did you? Pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. A horn is a sharp peaked mountain carved on all sides by a glacier. So for obvious reasons, it's called a horn. If we think about a horn on any animal like a rhinoceros, right? It comes to a point. It's a sharp peak, and it has that same look as any horn would. Um, and so in order for it to get that shape, it has to be carved out on all sides. And at this high altitude, it's only going to be glaciers that can do that. Um, lastly, I guess not lastly, we have a few more terms that go along with alpine glaciers. Um, after horn, we have a U-shaped valley. 
A U-shaped valley is what we're always going to see caused by a glacier or several glaciers. So when we looked at streams and we looked at surface water, we talked about the shape that streams and surface waters um, are going to make in the ground, right? So if we have a really fast running river running through a mountain, somebody raise your hand quick. What type of channel is it going to cut? What is the shape? Good, somebody should have said a V shape, right? That V shape means that it's moving very fast uh, and, and cutting through that rock or soil or whatever that surface is. Now, even when we have slower running streams, it's still going to be more V shaped than what we would see with a glacier. A glacier moves very slowly, it spreads out, and uh, in doing so, it's going to create a really wide, really U-shaped valley. A hanging valley. Hanging valley is really is kind of a tough, uh, tough one to illustrate, um, but I'll do my best in this and I'll try to explain it when I come back. So we can see that we have this U-shape here, right? Do you see where the waterfall is flowing down? We have this U-shape. That is a valley, a U-shaped valley. And that was carved out by a glacier. Now, where that water falls down the waterfall and it hits on the ground, that's the edge of another U-shaped valley carved by a glacier that was moving kind of perpendicular, like opposite direction, 90 degrees to where uh, this last glacier that I was talking about up top was moving. And so we end up getting this valley that's up high and it is hanging, so to speak, over this other valley. And what usually happens is we see a waterfall there. That's a pretty telltale sign that there is a hanging valley that we're looking at. A tarn. A tarn is a lake. Um, it's a lake that has a three-sided mountain right around it. Um, so it's, it's basically like a cirque with a lake in the middle. Here we can see that there is this lake and we can see this ridge on the back side and the picture doesn't completely show up but it kind of U-shapes around uh, into right in front of us. This foreground finishes off that tarn. So it's a cirque with a lake at the bottom. Now what I want you guys to do is pull out a piece of paper. Okay, on that piece of paper, I want you to go ahead and label one, two, three, four, and five, okay? One, two, three, four, and five. I'll give you one minute to do that. So teacher, go ahead and pause the video right now and wait until everyone gets a piece of paper with their name on it labeled, excuse me, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, great. Everyone should now have a piece of paper labeled one, two, three, four, and five with your name on top of it. Could be a little scrap piece of paper. It doesn't have to be a perfectly nice, neat one, okay? Now what I want you to do is, for number one, identify what these are. Now it says pattern oster lakes. That's something different. But these are lakes here that we're looking at. What would the vocab term be to describe these lakes? Write that for question number one. Number two. Number two is right here on top. I'm working from left to right, okay? So right here on top, this red arrow is pointing to the tip top of that mountain. That is formed by glaciers. What is that vocab term? Write it down, number two. Okay, good. Number three. Number three is right here. It's pointing at this U-shape, right? We have this U-shape on three sides. It's eroded and um, glaciers would be cutting out that action there, right? It's kind of a, I don't know how to describe it real well um, without telling you exactly what it is. It's like a, stage that somebody might be standing on with three sides of stadium seating going around it. 
That's number three. Number four. Number four, we can see a glacier that's moved down um, this little valley here, and on the other side, another glacier that's moved through it. And this red arrow is pointing straight down along this ridge here. What is that ridge called? That's number four. The technical geological term for this ridge. And number five, we have this U-shaped valley right here. We know that that's been carved by a glacier. And we have another U-shaped glacial valley down at the bottom here. Now usually what we see at this feature is a little waterfall that comes out of the bottom. So number five, down here at the bottom on the right, what is that geological term? Now what I want you to do is, teacher, if you need to pause here in a second, go ahead and do that. I want you to go ahead and take your papers. I want you to put them into your folders and put your folders away. Go ahead and pause if you need to. Okay, if you paused, uh, now we're coming back. Um, let's go ahead and move on. So those are all alpine glaciers. Alpine meaning in the mountains. So these are all glaciers that form in the mountains. Uh, all of those terminologies, uh, vocabulary terms, uh, different sections that we label of the glacier, those are all relating to alpine glaciers only. Now we're looking at continental glaciers. Gosh, continental glaciers, that's weird. Where would we see a continental glacier? Or what does that even mean? First of all, it's a glacier that's so huge that it could be covering an entire continent or it covers possibly most of the continent. We would call these more accurately ice sheets. And they form in polar regions with excessive amounts of snow. So Greenland, uh, Antarctica, those are both two really huge ice sheets and really famous ice sheets. And they count for 75% of all the fresh water on Earth. Right? So before we did a breakdown of water and we have uh, X amount of water on Earth and X amount of it is salt. And then of it that is fresh, the majority of it is stuck in ice sheets. And that's this. This is continental glaciers. 75% of that fresh water is in ice sheets. And continental glaciers are huge, massive, right? They, they cover all of Greenland. They cover uh, all of the Antarctica. Uh, they're a huge, broad ice sheet that spreads outwards from the zone of accumulation. So here's that term again, zone of accumulation. Now let's go ahead and look at, like, Greenland, right? This is Greenland, if you didn't know. It's that funny little place that is really white, but they call Greenland. Uh, right next to that little place, which is green, but they call Iceland, right? Funny story behind that. I'm sure Mr. O can tell you if he hasn't already. Now, we can see Greenland up here at the top. And if we look all the way to the left or to the west, we see Alaska, and we see all these little white spots, right? So if we look at Alaska, uh, it's pretty obvious that those glaciers are much smaller. Those are all alpine glaciers. They're up in the mountains. Um, they're huge, right? Don't, don't get me wrong. They're huge. Um, relatively speaking, but when we compare them to ice sheets or continental glaciers, they're very small. This is what an ice sheet might look like from flying overhead in an airplane. And I just said that we have the uh, zone of accumulation, and that's definitely true, right? We have an area, whoops, we have an area that is accumulating all of this snow, uh, which over time compresses and forms ice and it flows outwards. Now what I want you to do is, if you haven't already done this, take a look at that silly putty that was sitting on top of the projector. What does it look like now? Go ahead and take like a minute or two, teacher, you can pause here when I'm done talking. Take a minute or two and talk about 
why that silly putty has changed shape and what it looks like now, what it looked like before, and why it would become what it is now. Okay, go ahead and do that right now. Okay, I'm back with you. So what you should have said is that uh, Silly Putty is kind of a solid, but it's kind of a liquid. And we talked about this when we uh, discussed some, no, you know what, that was another class. Gosh, I have so many classes I get confused. But we talked about this in my physical science class when we talked about states of matter. And we talked about some scientists actually categorize ice as being still a liquid because ice can still flow. And by flow, we mean it, it changes shape. Uh, it doesn't retain its solid uh, shape always. And so, <clears throat> silly putty, even though it's solid, and we would all say that it's solid, it behaves like a liquid does. It flows. It takes time, but it flows. And ice is the same exact way. Ice can flow as well. And uh, if you had to describe the force that is actually making it flow, that's making it move and flatten out, it is just gravity. Gravity pulling down that, that ice, or in this case with the, with the silly putty, it's the silly putty being pulled down by gravity. And in doing so, it causes it to spread out. And so we get this uh, illusion, kind of, that this ice is like moving in a direction, almost like a person is on one side of it just pushing it. And that's definitely not what's happening. It's just spreading out. And we get the same exact features as what we would have with a uh, alpine glacier in terms of moraines. We would call it still a terminal moraine. Uh, we wouldn't have medial moraines. We wouldn't have lateral moraines because there is really no side to a huge ice sheet. There's just the front of it because it's moving in all directions just like the silly putty as it is sucked down by gravity, it spreads out in all directions. So after glaciation, meaning, okay, we go back to the nearest ice age, 12,000 years ago, 10 to 12,000 years ago, all the ice melts off, all the ice is gone. Um, that would be after glaciation. The glaciers move, they recede, and they're done. Uh, we have something called an esker. And this is really interesting. Um, an esker is a ridge of sediment that forms when a stream's tunnel flows through a glacier. So before we looked at uh, glaciers and we talked about them having crevices, and those crevices usually are formed by cracks. As, as it moves along uh, at different speeds, that ice pulls apart. So again, you can go back to the silly putty. What happens if you take the silly putty and you pull it too fast? Well, when you pull it too fast, it's going to break, right? If you've played with Silly Putty before, you know that. And that's what happens with glaciers as well. When you move a glacier too fast, it's going to break apart and you get a crevice that forms. And so this happens in uh, continental glaciers or ice sheets as well. And uh, we end up getting water that as it melts off, it runs down through those cracks and we get these inside the glacier uh, rivers basically, right? And we all know that rivers and streams transport material. And so as it flows through there, it's transporting material. It is eroding the ground and carrying sediment with it. And eventually, as all that ice melts off and is gone, we have this buildup of sediment that's run through. And it looks kind of like veins on the surface of your hand or uh, like mole holes, basically, right? I don't know if there's even moles in Alaska, but where I'm from, we have moles. And moles will move through the ground and we'll have uh, little tunnels that you can see right at the surface of the ground, all pushed up by the moles. Now in this case, it's just sediment. It's silt or sand that just piles up on top there. Um, and that's called an esker. Here's a great picture of an esker. Usually it's easier to see these from overhead, but this, it kind of looks just like a serpent or like a snake, right? This is a head down at the bottom and we can see it snaking back and forth and it's kind of tough to tell from this photo, but it goes pretty far back. That's all caused by the melt off of a glacier transporting sediment and this was a stream that was once inside of a glacier. 
And this is that same picture, uh, but it's just a map of it, and it's the topographic map. So we can see the different topographies of it from above um, and see that this is basically like a ridge that just runs really long all by itself. None of these contours are connecting over here. They're not connecting to it, and so it's not part of that. It's its own separate formation. The next term is a drumlin. Drumlins are streamlined hills of sediments that show the direction that a glacier flowed as it moved through. I'm not going to ask you too much in terms of drumlins. Uh, we do see them sometimes. Um, in fact, last summer I was driving down around Anchorage area and there are a few areas that I saw drumlins. So if you've been around that area, maybe you know what I'm talking about. But when you look at the little diagram here to the right, it says the direction of ice flow. It shows you the blunt end to the left, which is kind of where uh, that ice hits an object, maybe a, a larger hill or just an incline of some sort. And as it pushes over it, it tapers off down to the tapered end. And so we can see that from looking at this one on the left, uh, this glacier has moved from the left to the right. And what happens is usually it's going to do that in an area that has many hills in it, and we end up getting a whole bunch of them. And geologists will call this a basket of eggs topography, which it says over here on the bottom right. And we can see there's a whole bunch of them all piled up, and it's kind of like when you look down at your Easter basket, uh, which is coming up in just a couple weeks here. Uh, it's kind of like these exposed egg surfaces at the top. We see all of them in the same direction, and it tells us, hey, there's a big glacier that moved through here and it was going that way. This is just another view looking at one. We can see it says the Stoss end, the Lee slope. Forget about the, that terminology. Just understand that a drumlin shows us direction of flow. And it shows us direction of flow by the high steep part at the end where it first enters and tapers off towards the end where it's leaving. And that shows us the ice flow. Uh, the below is a topographic map showing us the different topographies. Uh, the green being a low topography, yellow being higher, and the orange being the highest. And so looking at a topographic map, we could identify areas with drumlins. Here's a picture, a black and white picture, right? I want you guys to uh, teach her in just one second. I want you to pause it, but um, when you pause it, I want everyone to take a look at them. I want you to kind of outline some of these drumlins and try to identify which direction you think these drumlins were going or the, the glacier was going. Okay, so go ahead and do that and answer it in terms of north, which is up in this case, east to the right, south to the bottom, west to the left. Which direction was this glacier running through here? And go. That means pause it. All right, coming back, uh, you should have circled some of those drumlins and drawn in the direction of flow. The direction of flow should be from bottom left towards upper right. We should be looking at a flow direction that's going to the northeast, right? To the northeast, like this. The next one is called an erratic. This is kind of a kind of a fun term. Erratic, when we describe behavior of something, uh, for example, I might say somebody in this class is acting erratic. Uh, if we say erratic, it means like unpredictable. Um, he just got up and walked out of class. That's so erratic, right? Um, in this case, we're talking about rocks that are acting erratic. Um, Glacier is moving rocks. And all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, unexpectedly, we see this huge rock that is not the same type of rock as all the other rocks around it. And it seems to be just crazily dropped there from nowhere. The only explanation is a glacier, because glaciers move huge amounts of rocks. It can move something that's extremely large, extremely heavy, and it can actually move it pretty long distances. And so we can see this top left picture. There's this little guy standing next to these huge rocks. They don't belong there. They're just dropped off by a glacier. Um, to the right, we see a similar photo. 
bottom left. I forget where this photo was taken, but I know that that rock is nowhere near any close or any type of rock uh, that's around it. So these mountains back here are something like sandstone or something, uh, but the erratic in the front, this big, huge, irregular rock is granite. None of the rocks in the mountains around it are granite, so how did it get there? It had to have been a big continental glacier. And then on the bottom right, we can see another one. Lastly is Kettle Lakes. Kettle Lakes, these are pretty cool because we see these all over Alaska. We see Kettle Lakes that form from different reasons. Um, we might see something that looks just like a Kettle Lake, but it's actually just permafrost underneath it. Um, but Kettle Lakes, what happens are we have, or what happens is, we have a big glacier moving through. That glacier starts to melt. Uh, we get things like an esker. Um, but we also get chunks of ice that fall off and they just sit on top of the land for a long time uh, as they slowly kind of melt off, right? And as it sits on the top surface, it might be relatively soft ground underneath it and it sinks into that ground and it causes a deep depression and eventually it melts and eventually it fills uh, that little depression and creates a lake. That is a kettle lake. Um, Kettle Lakes, like I said, we have features very similar to this up here. Uh, it's not necessarily from a glacier, though. Uh, it's more likely that it's just from permafrost being underneath it, and so we get water that accumulates at the surface. But a place that we do see a ton of Kettle Lakes is a little place called Minnesota. Ask Mr. Jacobson about that one. Um, Minnesota is called the Land of 10,000 Lakes. And those lakes are not from, you know, what most lakes form from. They are from glaciers that have broken off into small pieces and as they sat in the ground, made depressions and melted off forming lakes. Those are pretty much all kettle lakes up in Minnesota. Here's an overhead view of some kettle lakes. I don't know where this was taken. Quite easily could be from Minnesota. And the last one is a slide with all the answers to what you guys should have answered before. I'm not going to tell you, um, or I'm not going to show it to you because you should have turned it in. So at this point, take your notes, go ahead and make sure your name is on top of them, make sure you got everything filled in, and slip it into your folder. Very good.